This is Love Notes, daily devotions from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Grace and peace to you. Our text today is Mark, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8, the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you have your Bible out and you look at the 16th chapter of Mark, where the resurrection account is given, you'll probably see that verses 1 through 8 stand and then and then there's something called the shorter ending of Mark's gospel or the longer ending of Mark's gospel, which gives us basically four ways that this gospel could end. The first choice is one through eight, and it stops there. The shorter one can add a little bit, the longer ending more, or you can take both those together. It's really rather confusing. Most scholars across the whole long period of time have come to the conclusion based on evidence from ancient texts that the gospel of Mark as we have it ends at verse eight. And that's how I'm gonna treat the story today. What we see in the shorter and longer endings of Mark aren't unfaithful, but they address something that we don't get in Mark. You see, there are two ways that the resurrection is revealed to the disciples. One is by the empty tomb, and the second is by an appearance of Jesus. Mark's gospel, if we end at eight, has no appearance of Jesus. And that, that bothered the scribes who copied the, the gospel of Mark down through the years. And so later copies of the Gospel of Mark than the originals, well, they, uh, they had stuff added because people just couldn't quit scratching their heads over why the Gospel would end as it does at verse 8. It's a puzzling ending. So let's begin to take a look at it and see if we can make some sense of it. It tells us, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. The Sabbath is over when the sun sets on Saturday night. So this happens sometime after. And as the text is going to tell us, it probably suggests that this happens very shortly after dawn on Sunday morning. The anointing that they're going to give Jesus is one of two things, or maybe it's a little of both. It was very common for family members, for, for close friends, to anoint the body of a dead person for burial. There was a certain way that that anointing went about. But Jesus has been telling these women who've been with him from Galilee over and over again that he will rise on the third day. They have heard and seen that he is the Messiah. So there's a chance that they go hoping to anoint him as king. I kind of lean toward the former rather than the latter. I think they're completely surprised by what happens as is evidenced in the text. I think they go to anoint him for burial because they think the story is over. And they have finally, like all the other disciples, struggled to believe what Jesus told them in the first place. In verse 2, it says, very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, there's where I think we're at Sunday morning, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one, one another as they went, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They don't seem to be expecting any kind of miracle. They don't seem to be expecting to find Jesus or an empty tomb. They want to go and honor and give respect to a beloved one who has now died. And their problem is that big rock that sits in front of the entrance. But in verse 4, it says, When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, bigger than they could handle, had already been rolled back. Remember how the heavens were torn apart at Jesus' baptism? Remember how the curtain of the temple was torn in two when he died? Well, it seems now God is about the business of removing another boundary between life and death, heaven and earth. 
That big stone, which represents death, has been rolled away. Whatever was inside is now loose. Will it be death? Or will it be life? It might be a setup to some kind of zombie movie, I suppose. But we know that's not the case. So they enter the tomb. It's big enough for them to get inside. And when they get into the tomb, they see a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. Dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side are all kind of code words that suggest we're talking about a divine messenger, uh, an angel. Somebody who bears greetings from heaven. They were, of course, alarmed at this. Everybody that encounters angels in the Bible, because they are messengers of God, is alarmed. And the angel says what we typically know angels say in this situation. Do not be alarmed. You were looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Truth. He was crucified. Truth. He has been raised. There's the proclamation. He has been raised, just as he said he would be. Three times he told his disciples that he would be put to death on the cross and on the third day rise, and here it is. It's happened. He is not here. He's not here in the place of death. He's out and loose in the world once again. The messenger says, look, there is the place where they laid him. It's empty. Go now and tell his disciples and Peter. I always think that's an interesting thing for Mark to have put in here. Uh, Peter, who was the leader who never got it. Peter, who denied Jesus three times. Peter, whose sin against Jesus is really as great as Judas's. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. That's the place where it all started. He's going back to the place where the whole Gospel of Mark has taken place up until the last week. He's going back to the place where they all met Jesus and saw his signs and wonders and heard his teaching. There you will see him. There an appearance will take place. There you will see him just as he told you. In other words, listen. On the Mount of the Transfiguration, remember uh, the voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now they're being called to listen again and to go and do as he told them. And now comes verse 8. The most perplexing verse in Mark's gospel. For if it is truly the end, it's an odd one. Some scholars believe that the Gospel of Mark had stuff that was lost. And so what we have is a truncated version of the Gospel. There's no way to prove that. There's no way to know that. Personally, I continue to come back to the fact that the story ends here. And listen to how it ends. So they went out, the women who have seen the empty tomb, they've seen the messenger, they've heard the word, they've received the command to go and tell all of the disciples, including Peter, to go back to Galilee. They've been told to announce. So they went out and they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. I'm still with them. But then the next clause, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Why would Mark end the gospel there? I think there's several things that we can say. First, we're reading this and we know that somebody must have said something to somebody or we wouldn't be hearing this story. Mark has written the gospel, and so in fact, somebody spoke. We have seen all throughout the gospel that Jesus would tell people to be silent about his 
his place in the world, his messiahship. He would tell them not to say anything and they couldn't help themselves. They'd go out and they'd speak. Now we have a reversal of that. The ones who are told to speak, to finally tell the truth because they have the full picture of the story, they stay silent. And it begs a question. What will you do, dear reader, dear disciple of Jesus? Will you too keep silent even though he's commanded you to speak? Though he's commanded us all to stand on the, on the rooftops and to declare that death no longer has the final word? Will you just stay there in Jerusalem grieving or will you go back to Galilee? I think in a literary way, this is also a suggestion that we go back and start this gospel and read it from the beginning again. It's not that long with the full knowledge that what Jesus says about being raised on the third day comes true. You know, if you read a mystery novel and you don't know who done it until the end, you have one experience. If you read the end and go back and then read it again, you'll find all of the clues. It will have deeper meaning. And I think that's exactly what Mark is proposing here. First off, to ask the question, will you stay silent? How can you? And secondly, to have us now encounter the story of Jesus knowing that God has said yes to the world's no. I find this a most powerful proclamation of the resurrection because it doesn't let me put any distance between me and the call to say something. A call to witness to the resurrected life of Jesus, one full of grace and mercy and peace, of healing and hope. My friends, they said nothing. Let us pray that we will not be so silent. Amen.